would like to introduce our opening speaker, Major General Alan Salisbury, United States Army, retired. General Salisbury is a graduate of West Point and holds a master's and a doctoral degree from Stanford University. He completed a distinguished 30-year career in the Army with his final assignment as the Commanding General of the United States Army Information System Engineering Command. Currently, he is the Chairman and CEO of the Code of Support Foundation, a not-for-profit organization that serves members of the armed services, veterans, and their families. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving General Salisbury a warm welcome. Well, I'm truly humbled to be invited to be here today and share some remarks with you that maybe set the tone for uh, a lot of what you're going to be hearing through the, through the morning. I want to start off with a simple statement. 23 veterans will commit suicide in the United States today. Every day, 23 veterans on the average commit suicide. The majority of these are Vietnam veterans. Why is that? Well, the reasons are many and complex, but they begin with what I'd like to call a tale of two wars, with apologies to Charles Dickens. In Dickens' own words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Let's start with the worst. We've already seen that almost everybody here is a veteran or in some way has been connected with the, with the service, and how we have a lot of Vietnam veterans today. Flashback to 1965 to 1975. What kind of a reception did you receive when you came home? I think the answer would be quite different for those returning in the mid-60s and for those returning in the, the mid-70s, early 70s. Essentially, the answer is increasingly hostile. It's no secret that the draft was extremely unpopular. With the exception of a privileged few who had other priorities, it cut across a broad cross-section of America. And of course, the war itself became increasingly unpopular, ending with Lyndon Johnson bemoaning, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost the American people. The saddest part of the situation is that in addition to blaming the government, the public blamed the soldier who was simply doing his duty under the Constitution. This treatment by the public stained the already bad memories that many had of the battlefield. Many books have analyzed the conduct of a war. Under Westmoreland, for instance, the emphasis was on body count and he continually assured Washington that this strategy was winning the war. Later came Creighton Abrams, who shifted the strategy to clear and hold. Bob Sorley's book will tell you about the real progress made with that approach. There are many more books that slice and dice the geopolitics of the war. We all know the toll it eventually took on Lyndon Johnson, more recently, we have Robert McNamara's Mea Culpa book, which reads somewhat like a Shakespearean tragedy, detailing how screwed up things got here at home, in the Pentagon, the White House, the State Department, and on Capitol Hill. Without belaboring the subject, the view of many is that we were actually winning the war on the ground when Washington finally pulled the plug and lost the war for us. None of this did much to make the troops feel good about what they were doing, much less how the public felt about their service and sacrifice. Lessons learned and too often forgotten will be analyzed and reanalyzed in this area for decades to come. Acknowledging that as a communicator operating out of Long Bin, my war was vastly different from those in the frontline combat units, my personal bottom line is I'm very proud of my service in Vietnam, and I expect that those of you in this room who serve there are equally proud of your service. Even if you didn't have a lot of interaction with the South Vietnamese people, forget the government, 
The film footage of the last helicopters lifting off the roof of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon should make it clear that the people valued freedom and understandably feared for their future under communist rule. Political and strategic analyses of the merits of the war notwithstanding, on a personal level, we were there to fight for freedom and fight against tyranny. Now, flash forward to 2001 through today. Relatively speaking, it can be said that this has been the best of times in terms of public support for our troops who are generally regarded as heroes. In part, this is due to a lack of a draft, which lessens or eliminates the pain by the 99% of Americans who are not and have not served. <coughs> Excuse me. Reality is that most Americans do not even know someone who is serving or has served. In fact, in effect, these wars have been outsourced to less than one half of 1% of the American people who volunteer to serve, while the general public has never been asked to share at all in the burden. And in fact, the one thing they were asked to do was simply go shopping. Support our troops bumper stickers and applause in airport terminals aside, for most Americans, these wars have been just another item given relatively minimum coverage in the media. Today we have roughly 22 million veterans in this country. A little over 2 million are veterans of the current wars, with a smaller number from, <coughs> excuse me, from Gulf War I, Kosovo, and other conflicts. The vast majority of today's veterans are actually from the Vietnam era. Some 50,000 current veterans are classified as wounded warriors. Many, if not most, who survive today would not have survived similar wounds in Vietnam. Our combat medical capabilities have advanced by quantum leaps over the last 40 years, and our hats and hearts go out to the medical community for that. Beyond the physically wounded, however, we still have a long way to go. In World War I, we had soldiers suffering from shell shock. In World War II, it was called combat fatigue. Both of these terms were often laced with aspersions over it or otherwise of cowardice. Today, we have advanced to a slightly better understanding term of post-traumatic stress disorder, or as some would prefer, PTSI, substituting injury for disorder. This is often compounded with traumatic brain injury, or TBI, which can sometimes, but not always, <clears throat> be indicated with clear physical evidence. The second good news is that we are beginning to understand PTSD and develop effective treatments for it, when and if diagnosed. PTSD is frequently in the news, too often because of its consequences, causing a handful to create violent mayhem. A case can be made that this has been a detriment to the hiring of veterans for unfounded fear that they are all walking time bombs. The bad news is that undiagnosed PTSD, TBI, and the general impact of multiple deployments on both service members and their families have resulted in as many as 30% of returning veterans having moderate to severe issues impacting their ability to successfully transition from the military and reintegrate into society. One more good news story. Today, there are more than 40,000 nonprofit organizations with troops or veterans in their mission statements. This is especially important since even if the DOD and the VA support systems were functioning at 100% efficiency and 100% capacity, they could not begin to accommodate the needs of 22 million veterans, much less their families. The private sector is absolutely essential to their well-being as part of the solution. I don't know the number of such organizations that were around in the 60s and 70s, but I would be surprised if it were even one-tenth of what we have today. So the troops and families are fully covered, right? Unfortunately, not so. First, among these 40,000 organizations, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. Most, by far, are good, and almost all are well-meaning. The not-so-good are usually just ineffective or inefficient stewards of the public's charitable donations. 
At the far end of the spectrum are the ugly, and you've read about them from time to time, out and out frauds. <clears throat> the majority of these organizations are so small as to have a minimum impact on the big picture, notwithstanding the great work they do for the small numbers they serve. Many more offer very limited services, often to a very limited client population. In fact, probably 90% of these organizations are restricted as to who they serve, what branch of service, what era they served, discharge status, and the like. Where they operate, usually in some limited geography, and the kinds of services they provide. The spectrum of needs is broad. Healthcare, mental health, financial aid, financial counseling, housing, education, employment, child welfare, and access to benefits, to name the most common. So how does that 30%, by the way, 30% of 2 million, 600,000 plus their family members, how does that 30% of today's vets who are struggling with reintegration get the help they need? The answer is, unfortunately, with great difficulty. There are a few directories out there that have limited, often unvetted, out-of-date information. Many just simply Google. If you're a veteran needing immediate financial assistance, the names and phone numbers of 60 to 100 organizations might pop up. Dialing for dollars will probably yield a stream of no answers before someone responds that they may be able to help and then might determine that this situation does not meet their strict criteria. If this vet is already in crisis mode, this is not helpful. Oh, and by the way, the DOD warrior transition units and VA counselors generally do not consider telling the vet about the nonprofits because the government cannot appear to endorse a private organization. True, the Red Cross and the USO are exceptions here that have a special status. That's a pretty realistic description of the veteran services landscape today, even as the population of veterans is swelling. Now I'd like to tell you briefly about the Code of Support Foundation best troop support organization you've never heard of. <laughs> With the encouragement of a number of senior retired military friends, I founded this organization in late 2010 with the mission of asking the 99% to step up to do their share in keeping America strong and safe, bridging the growing military-civilian divide, where the 1% follow a six-article code of conduct in which they pledge they are prepared to give their lives in our defense. We created a parallel six-article code of support for the other 99% to give meaning to the word support our troops. About two years ago, as the landscape I just described became clear to us, and we were seeing unmet vital needs all around us, we decided that as an organization, we needed to step up ourselves to address this critical gap, and we did so. Today, we are working hard in two mutually supporting program areas with a small staff of about eight, including AmeriCorps VISTA National Service members and a couple of current war veterans, which we hope to be able to grow to about 14 this summer. Four of these young staff members are assigned as full-time case coordinators. Calls come into us daily, most having been referred to us by other nonprofits some even informally by the VA and the DOD. We follow a detailed intake process to vet the case and determine all of their individual eligibility requirements and limitations. Our case coordinators take ownership of the case, and working from our own extensive knowledge base, we reach out on their behalf to find the right organizations to solve their problems. I said organizations in plural because virtually all of our cases are complex involving multiple needs, and our aim is to treat the whole family in a holistic manner. Most calls start with a single urgent need, usually financial. The family is about to be evicted, for instance. We find the dollars needed to stop the bleeding, often that same day, but then peel back the onion to find the underlying issues. There is little point in paying the rent today if they will be back in the same situation 30 days from now. The root problem may be unemployment or poor financial management. They may have lost their job for behavioral reasons. That may require the services of a mental health specialist who could uncover previously undiagnosed PTSD 
and so on down the line. We stay with the case until the family is back on its feet and functioning, and then follow up downstream to see if it all is still well. We're pretty unique in taking this complete wraparound approach. Long story short, <clears throat> we helped over 300 warriors and family members in 2014 and are on track to double that this year. Part of that capacity increase is coming from our supporting program, which is developing the IT tools to make our case coordination effort more efficient and productive. We're now entering the beta testing phase of building our Patriot Net environment, as we call it, to bring our knowledge base online and efficiently search it to identify the best sources to fill the needs of each individual case. When the Patriot Net tool is completed and fully tested, we plan on giving it to other organizations as well to leverage beyond our own in-house capability. Unlike a large percentage of those 40,000 organizations, Code Support Foundation serves veterans of all wars, and not just the current ones. In our caseload for 2014, 5% were Vietnam veterans. We expect that number to grow as the word gets around of who we are and what we do. We can't advertise our services yet because we already get all the workload we can handle. We'd like to be able to do more, of course. I've been describing for you an environment considerably different today from that which we had in the Vietnam era. If, for instance, back in the 60s and 70s, we had the current mental health system, imperfect as it may be, a significant percentage of our Vietnam veterans would not be in the situation they are today. They not only constitute the majority of 23 suicides every day, they also comprise the majority of our homeless veterans. On any given night, 57,849 veterans are homeless. 57,849 homeless veterans every night. Shame on us, America. You'll hear more about then versus now picture later today, I think especially in the second panel. Our Code of Support Foundation Executive Director, Christina Kaufman, will be part of that panel, and she'll be sharing her detailed experience. Thank you, and I look forward to having a great day with you. Any questions, I'll be glad to take. Any, any questions? Okay. okay thank you.